Many of you know that uh, the American Friends Service Committee works quite a bit on a number of peace issues, and maybe one of the first that was uh, worked on here in Western Massachusetts by Francis Crow, who is here and the founder of the office. Uh, is the issue of nuclear weapons uh, and, and war and nuclear weapons. Uh, and that has luckily um, brought us Tim, Tim and Wallace here tonight. Um, we're going to hear from them in just a minute. Um, the issue of nuclear weapons is now not just as, but even more important and more precarious than it was um, 50 years ago. And uh, I'm not the only one who thinks that. It's the uh, Atomic Bulletin of Scientists also um, believes that and, and recognizes that uh, the threat of nuclear war, particularly with now escalating tensions with Russia and the proliferation of nuclear weapons around the, the world, uh, is increasing. Um, and to that effect, um, in addition to having Tim here to talk about uh, his experience at the UN with an amazing, groundbreaking treaty uh, that uh, was signed by 122 countries, um, there are a couple of other events that you should know about uh, in the in the next month and in next couple of months. And the first one is uh, next um, and two Sundays on August 6th on Hiroshima Day. Uh, there are these cards that are these yellow cards that are here and also in the table outside. Uh, it's the annual remembrance of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, for the first time in its 35 year history, I believe, um, we're actually holding it outside of Northampton. We're holding it on the pond in uh, East Hampton. Uh, and that's going to be a large gathering uh, at Nashawanic Pond um, from starting at 7 o'clock. And we're going to have our uh, traditional lantern ceremony on the pond. Uh, at approximately 8 o'clock. Um, the mayor is actually expected to come and speak, um, and there's a number of artists, uh, musicians, uh, and other folks who are going to be presenting that as well. Um, on September 23rd, there is going to be a conference sponsored by the Physicians for Social Responsibility, the Pioneer Valley, um, about uh, nuclear war and climate change. Uh, and that is going to feature a bit by Phil McKibben, uh, and I, I see members of PSR, Physicians for Social Responsibility, here in the audience today. And so that's going to be an all-day event uh, at the Hadley Arms uh, Conference Center. Uh, and so we strongly urge you to attend that as well. Um, in addition to Bill McKibben, um, Dr. Ira Helfand, and Dr. Marty Nathan, and a couple of other people who aren't doctors, will be there and talking about um, the intersection of nuclear, uh, nuclear weapons and climate change. Um, so, uh, with that, I'm really pleased to introduce Tim here today. Um, Tim uh, is the representative of uh, the Quakers in Britain and represented them at the United Nations, was part of the historic uh, treaty that was negotiated in the last couple of months at the United Nations um, that banned nuclear weapons. Uh, and that is a tremendous step forward something he's going to talk about, uh, and um, it is something that, uh, as uh, Setsuo Thurlow, who is one of Habakusha, one of the uh, survivors of uh, Hiroshima, said that she always knew that nuclear weapons were immoral, and now she can say that they're illegal as well. Um, so with that, uh, I'm going to introduce Tim. Uh, his book, uh, you can get a signed book by the author here tonight afterwards. Um, and, we're, and so after uh, he presents, we're going to take questions from the audience. I'm going to run around with a wireless microphone. And at the end, um, he'll be signing copies of his book. Um, with that, um, here's Tim. Thanks. So is this, um, can everybody see the slides? Over to that side. Okay. Good. Well, thanks everybody for coming. Um, as as uh, Jeff said, we're going to have uh, I'm going to do a little presentation with the slides, and then we can have lots of questions and answers. But I've got two parts to the slides. The first part is a bit upsetting, so I just want to warn you. Uh, everybody in this audience, as far as I can see has been around long enough to know what we're talking about, mm -hmm. nuclear weapons. Um, but 
The second part will be uplifting, so hold on for, for that part. And there will be some light relief as well. So I'll do my best to, um, to keep your spirits up. But we're going to start with a little quiz. Because um, certainly in my own work, uh, I've found that um, people are very, very poorly informed about nuclear weapons. And that's why um, I worked on the book. I was first asked to put the reasons why nuclear weapons are bad on the back of a postcard. So if you want the short version, it's there. <laughs> I then did a, a, a four-page briefing, and then I did a 12-page frequently asked questions. So those are all free if you want to take a copy of those. But it just kept getting longer and longer, trying to answer the questions that people have about Korea, North Korea, about Russia, about deterrence, about non-proliferation, all these questions. So I've tried to answer them all in the book. There's nothing new in there. It's all gathered information from lots and lots of sources to help people to um, be more clear about these issues. So the quiz is to try to see what I, I don't know. I don't know what people know about nuclear weapons uh, from from the from the looks from here. I would guess. Most of you are over 30, so um, <laughs> people under 30 tend to have very little understanding of nuclear weapons at all. They, they don't talk about it, it's not in the news, it's not something they study, and they just don't know anything about it. And in Britain, I ask questions about nuclear weapons, and they, they don't even know that Britain has nuclear weapons. Um, from people over 30, including myself, you know, I was involved in this, and I have to say that Francis Crowe got me into all this um, many, many years ago in the, in the 70s, you know, and I was very active in the 1980s, as I'm sure many of you were. Uh, and I thought, to be honest, that after the Cold War ended, the Berlin Wall came down, they started moving uh, missiles and so on out of Europe, you know, I thought, well, okay, we can forget about that and work on something else. And then I came back to this issue only a couple of years ago to discover that it's just it's the same as it was in the 1980s. In fact, it's worse, but people don't know about it, which makes it even more scary. So, um, who knows how many people were killed by the first atomic bomb dropping in Hiroshima? How many people killed? Well, some say 100,000, 110, but I read recently that 150,000 would be a truer figure. Okay, any other takers on that number? So, nobody knows is the answer. Nobody knows. Uh, there were 20,000 prisoners of war from Korea that were killed, that, you know, that were never counted. However, the official, officially, most people use the figure 140,000. Um, however, uh, the city of Hiroshima keeps a ongoing record of the names of every single person that they consider to have been a victim of that bomb. And they're still adding those names today because people are still dying from cancers and leukemias and so on. It's hard to prove, but they've got over 260,000 names on that list and they're, they're still added to it. Okay, this is a bomb from the Second World War. It's about a, a quarter of a ton of TNT equivalent. Okay? And that's how we measure nuclear weapons. So that's a quarter of a ton of uh, TNT. This is another bomb in London, which was much more recent from the IRA. One ton of TNT, which caused one billion pounds worth of damage. So that's one ton of TNT. What do you think? Oh, this is the Moab. Who, who can tell me what the Moab is? Mother of all. The mother of all bombs. Donald Trump's very first act as president to explode this bomb, which had been around for years, but they never used it until April of this year. Who knows how big that one is? That's the largest conventional weapon without nuclear. Yeah. 200,000. Um, no, 2,000. Well, it's uh, pounds or... <laughs> it's 11 tons, 11 tons. So that's 11 times that one. And that's the largest explosion you can have with a, with a non-nuclear uh, um, yeah. explosives. So, who knows how many tons of TNT were dropped by the one atom bomb in Hiroshima, and similarly in Nagasaki. Anybody know? How many tons? 15,000. Oh. So, 15 kilotons. So that's 15,000. Um, so, as you can see, 
4.7 square miles, 69% of all the buildings destroyed. And, you know, you, I'm sure you've all seen these pictures, you know, that's what 15,000 tons of TNT can do to a city. This is the largest test nuclear weapon that was ever exploded, uh, by the US anyway. Anybody know how big the largest one that was ever tested? I think it was 15 megatons. 15 megatons, that is 15 million tons. That's a thousand times bigger than the one dropped on Hiroshima. Where was that though? That was a test in the South Pacific. And they, yeah, they were ships. They, they, they massively mis miscalculated that and caused, you know, I, I don't know if you've heard of the Lucky Dragon. This was in 1953, so it was a long time ago. Um, thankfully, they don't make bombs bigger than that anymore. Okay, they did. There was the, the Russians had, or the Soviets, had a nuclear weapon that was 50 megatons. Um, but thankfully, they have um, removed those. So who, who would like to guess um, how many Hiroshima-sized bombs it would take to cause a famine that could kill up to 2 billion people? And I'm, if you've heard Ira Helfand speak, he's the expert on this, um, and he's quoted extensively in my book. Um, but they've done a lot of research, first on the nuclear winter, and then more recently on this idea that um, a, a relatively small number of nuclear weapons exploding, for instance, between India and Pakistan, or just, you know, going off by the, well, North Korea, for instance, or US, Russia, they would affect the climate and the growing season uh, of the major crop producing parts of the globe. And I'm not gonna go into all the details of the you know, this, this is the cooling effect, but I mean, how many, how many Hiroshima-sized bombs do you think it would take to starve two billion people from a nuclear famine? Any, any takers? Half a dozen? Close, close. Fifteen, fifteen. No, I'm sorry, no. A hundred, a hundred Hiroshima-sized bombs, which is actually about fifteen of the present day, the, the smallest Nuclear weapon in the U.S. arsenal today is 100 kilotons. That's already six times the one dropped on Hiroshima. And it would take only 15 of those, or 100 of the smaller ones, to cause what, you know, as scientists estimate, would cause a global um, famine. So, who knows how many nuclear weapons there are in the world right now? Too many. Too many is a good answer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 16,000. Okay, it's about 16,000, 15,000. It's actually going down, which is good. Anybody know how many there were at the height of the Cold War in 1983? The US had 35,000, and the Soviets had a similar number. So there was about 70,000 nuclear weapons in the height of the Cold War. There are now about 15,000, which is good, hooray, right? Anybody listen to the radio this morning? Because I was asked this question. Well, you know, that's not really what it sounds like, is it? Because they got rid of a lot of small ones and a lot of old ones, and they've got much more powerful ones now, and so they don't need so many. So actually, you know, they've got 15,000 nuclear weapons, but those are very, very dangerous ones, and they've got rid of what they, they didn't want. So how many of those, how many of those do you think are on? Okay, so who, who? Oh, sorry, wait a minute, hold on. <laughs> do you know who has, who has the weapons? Who, ha who has nuclear weapons? US. US, definitely. Russia. Who else? Russia. 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 China. 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 India. Israel. Yes, Israel. India. Who? India. India. France. 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 Pakistan. 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 Germany. Britain. No, nope, not Germany. Britain. North Korea. Yep, yeah, not North Korea already. There's two more. Unless you already heard nothing. Oh, France. 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 I think we said France. Canada. France. France. Yeah. Yeah. India, Pakistan, France, China, China Russia, US, Iran. Nope. No. Yeah. South Africa had them and got rid of them. Um, uh, did we miss anybody else? Well, this doesn't have North Korea because this was a couple of years out of date. But, um, well, it has them as, it doesn't have them down on this list or something. But anyway, uh, how, many, how many do you think North Korea has? Yeah, nobody really knows, but you know, maybe eight, maybe as many as eight. Uh, the U.S. has about seven thousand. Russia actually has less than that now. They both have about seven thousand. How many of these fifteen thousand nuclear weapons do you think are on hair trigger alert, ready to launch at a moment's notice, possibly 
on warning of an incoming missile, which they have to launch before the missile can hit them. Anybody know? A couple thousand. A couple thousand on each side. So it's the US has 2,000 and Russia has 2,000 on hair trigger alerts. Yeah. If you go back to the slide before the question, yeah. would you still keep Iran on that list as a potential? No, agreement? no. It's, um, they, signed the they signed the agreement. Yeah. Who knows what's going to happen now, if they're going to be, again, sort of okay. penalized by, by the US administration. But they don't, they don't know. They shouldn't be on that list. This, as I said, is a little bit out of date. Uh, so we all know about the Cuban Missile Crisis, right? We know that for 13 days in 1962, the world was on the brink of nuclear war and could have, could have been in nuclear war any time during that period. How many other times since 1945 has the world been that close or even closer to nuclear war? Anybody know? More than a couple, more than six, more than, yeah. 13 times. There have been, and the most recent was in 2010, and that was when a, um, uh, uh, a Norwegian research rocket was fired towards Russia. They'd already they'd informed the Russian authorities that there was going to be a research rocket, so the Russians should have known and should have been prepared for it. But unfortunately, you know, the chain didn't get to the right place, so somebody in Russia knew, but the person who had the radar didn't know, and so they informed their commander that there was an incoming missile coming towards Moscow. I mean, it wasn't, but they didn't know that. Um, and um, they, um, in fact, I think it was Yeltsin was, no, 2010, was it Yeltsin? Oh, that would be Putin. That would be Putin, okay. There was another case where Yeltsin was involved, but anyway, in 2010, there was this Norwegian rocket. There have been more than a dozen other cases where we've come that close to an actual nuclear war, and people don't even know about it. You know. Uh, how many accidents have there been with nuclear weapons being dropped by mistake and not actually detonating? So the rock, the bombs have all these tr um, safety devices on them. In this particular case, there were six safety devices. Five of them broke, but the sixth one kept it from exploding. And if it hadn't, this is what would have been the effect of that one bomb that they dropped on North Carolina by mistake in 1961. Wow. Who knows how many how many accidents like this have happened? Was in Spain. No. There was one in Spain. Yeah. yeah. The number in the islands, the Marshall Islands. Well, those were the tests. There were little, you know, there were tests. But how many accidents do you think there were that we've that we've not you know not been told about? Officially, the U.S. admits to 32 accidents involving nuclear weapons and they say that they lost they lost eight of their weapons okay so there are eight u.s nuclear weapons missing they actually found one um there it is somebody found a nuclear bomb oh. under, under the sea there's how many how many how many nuclear weapons do you think are at the bottom of the sea right now apart from this one which they found well, I've, I've read in several reports that there are dozens, and I read at least two reports that there are more than 50, 5 nuclear weapons at the bottom of the sea. And those are weapons that have fallen off ships by mistake, you know, rolled off the deck. Uh, there are submarines that have, um, you know, ended up at the bottom of the sea. I'm sure you've heard about the, the Russian one, the Kurtz, 120 sailors and um, like 30 or more nuclear weapons are still down there at the bottom of the sea. But there's also been plane crashes like the one you mentioned. They can't, they, they've searched and searched, they find some of them and they don't find the rest of them. Uh, one of the scary things about global warming is that there was some, a very serious uh, plane crash in Greenland and the nuclear weapons are still in the ice and the ice is melting. So who knows what will happen when those are then become, uh, come to the surface as it were. Um, this this one this accident here. There was another accident. I, I, I can't remember. I'm not very good with my U.S. geography. But one was in North Carolina and one was in South Carolina. And one of them, there was a, a three megaton bomb that crashed into a field, and it went into the mud. And it was about 60 feet underground, and it's still there because they're afraid to touch it. And it's still there. I mean, at least they know where it is. They don't know where it's other. <laughs> 
So, is the world becoming safer or less safe? Is there more risk or less risk the longer this goes on? What do you think? Well, Jeff already told you the answer. <laughs> so, this slide is out of date. Anybody know what the Atomic Bulletin of Atomic Science Doomsday Clock is set to right now? Two and a half minutes to midnight. It's the closest it's been since the 1950s. Okay, here is the, the story of the Doomsday Clock. When the Cold War ended, you can see 1988, 1991, the clock was set back to 17 minutes to midnight, which is the, the furthest back it's been. That's still kind of scary, you know, 17 minutes to midnight. But it's been going steadily close to midnight, and it's now at two and a half minutes to midnight. Why? Because all of the people that know how to look after these weapons are dying or retiring. All the mechanisms and systems that are in place to look after these weapons are getting older and older. And just by the statistics of probability, the risks are increasing every day. There are, I don't know if you've read some of these things about, um, you know, a whole entire missile wing was um, court-martialed for failing various tests, you know, drug tests. They, had, they have a test that they're given about what they're supposed to do in case of an accident, and they all failed it. So, I mean, you know, we've got people who don't know how to look after these weapons, and uh, Ira Helston is the expert on, on the sort of climate effects, but there's somebody else called Eric Slosser. Did anybody heard of yeah. him? He's written a really scary book called <laughs> Command and Control, which is about all these different accidents and all the risks that, are, that, we're, that we're facing with these weapons. But the biggest risk, and of course, you know, I was asked this question on the radio this morning, you know, what about uh, an unstable president with their finger on the button? And that's not just North Korea. <laughs> so, you know, we've got, we've got people playing games. I mean, there's all these risks of an accident or a miscalculation, flock of geese go across the radar, a, you know, Norwegian um, uh, missile, uh, you know, test, test rocket. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of the case where um, they put the toilet paper on a, um, on a bomber carrying nuclear weapons too close to the heater behind the, behind the seats of the pilot and set fire to the plane and the, the plane went down and those, those um, are some of the 50 uh, weapons that are missing. But I mean, all these risks pale into insignificance if somebody is going to press the button on purpose. And that is the risk that we're facing right now, not just from him uh, or him, but from any, any of these people that have nuclear weapons. I, I had a very scary um, conversation uh, in England not that long ago with a sailor who was uh, working on um, the nuclear submarines. And he said, when he was being trained, they asked him, how are we doing the time? They asked, they asked him, um, we're just about finished with the upsetting part, we're going to go on to the uplifting part. <laughs> uh, they asked him, you know, who, who do they think would use nuclear weapons first? And they all said, oh, Korea or, you know, India, Pakistan. And the, his commander said, no, not the US even. He said, Britain would be the first to use nuclear weapons because we know what they're for, and we're ready to do it. These other guys are too scared, but we're not scared. We're going to, we're going to be, you know, if we, if we get pushed where we need to use our nuclear weapons, we'll use them. So that's even more scary to me than, than some of these people. So, of course, what people say is, oh, don't worry about, don't worry yourself about all these problems, you know, nuclear weapons, they're, they're very, very dangerous, but that's because they're just there for a, as a deterrent, right? We're never going to use them. No one has to worry about it. They're, they're actually there to stop other people using them. And as long as we have nuclear weapons, we're all safe because that's keeping everybody else from using their nuclear weapons. And this is, uh, I've got quite a few chapters about this in my book because it's the, the, the crux of the whole issue that people think, oh, nuclear weapons ended World War II. They saved Western Europe from Soviet invasion. They're keeping the world safe and we need them to deter the bad guys. But I found a, a little clip for you, which just explains deterrence better than I can possibly do. I don't know if any of you have seen the program Yes, Prime Minister from Britain. No. no. It's a conversation between the Prime Minister and his chief advisor in the civil service, uh, and it's explaining why they need Trident. So this was, this was made in 1980, so that's already 
37 years ago, 37 years ago, and they were about to replace Polaris, which was the old nuclear submarines, with Trident, which was the new nuclear submarines, which the US and Britain both have now. Uh, and this is his explanation as to why they have to have them. And I hope this sound will work. You have to do your thing with that. It should be on. It's not. <laughs> it was working before. Let's turn it off. Okay. Naturally, it should have Polaris, but Polaris is a ramshackle old system. The Soviets might easily develop a multi layered ballistic missile defense system which could intercept Polaris. I reckon. Well, in strategic terms, any day now. This is 1980. By what year? Sir? 2020. <laughs> sooner than you think. And are you saying that this nuclear defense system would stop all 192 Polaris missiles? Well, not all, and then virtually all 97%. And that would still leave, what, about five bombs that would get through? Precisely, a mere five. Enough to obliterate Moscow, Leningrad, Minsk. Yes, but that's about all. Just <laughs> <laughs> thought it was enough to make the Russians stop and think, but it's not fair. <laughs> With Trident, we could obliterate the whole of Eastern Europe. We could obliterate the whole of Eastern Europe. But it's a deterrent. It's a bluff. I probably wouldn't use it. Yes, but they don't know that you probably wouldn't. They probably do. Yes, they probably know that you probably wouldn't, but they can't. <laughs> they probably certainly know that I probably wouldn't. Yes, but even though they probably certainly know that you probably wouldn't, they don't certainly know that although you probably wouldn't, there's no probability that you certainly would. <laughs> simple issue. You are the Prime Minister, the Prime Minister of Great Britain. Don't you believe that Great Britain should have the best? Yes, of course. Very well. If you walked into a nuclear missile showroom, you would buy excitement. <laughs> it's lovely, it's elegant, it's beautiful. It is quite simply the best, and Britain should have the best. In the world of the nuclear missile, it is the, the Samuel Rose suit, the Rolls Royce called Niche. The Chateau Lafitte of 1945. Oh. It is the nuclear missile Harrods would say. <laughs> <laughs> what more can I say? Don't need to cost 15 million pounds if we don't need it. We can say that about anything at Harrods. <laughs> talking about the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, and I'm sure at the time, and maybe even today, uh, you were all told or convinced that, at least in the case of the Cuban Missile Crisis, deterrence worked, because Kennedy stood up to Khrushchev and said, if you step beyond this line, we're going to smash you, and so Khrushchev backed off, and that's what deterrence is all about. It's about being able to threaten nuclear disaster for everybody and getting your way. But let's just review what actually happened in the Cuban Missile Crisis, which maybe all of you know, I don't know, I, I didn't know about it. But if you remember, this is um, the, 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 the photograph that was used um, on, you know, a bit, like, a bit like the Iraq War when they put the photograph of Saddam Hussein's, you know, mobile chemical weapons trucks or whatever. This was the proof that the Soviets were putting uh, nuclear missiles in Cuba and Kennedy said, you know, lay off, back off, or we're going to smash you. And the, the threat was that missiles from Cuba could reach Washington within 20 minutes. Now, what I didn't know, I don't know how many of you knew this, was that just before the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1961, um, the US put missiles in Turkey that could reach Moscow within 20 minutes. Does everybody know about that? Yeah. Jupiter missiles? Yeah. And did you know that? The Cuban Missile Crisis was not resolved because Kennedy threatened Khrushchev and Khrushchev backed down. It was resolved because behind the scenes they had telephone conversations and Kennedy agreed to withdraw, with, with, remove these missiles from Turkey if Russia would remove the missiles from Cuba. So it was straightforward, plain old diplomacy that saved the day, not nuclear deterrence. And not many people realize that. But of all the arguments, uh, in favor of deterrence, this is the one that, for me, uh, resolves it once and for all. These are the nine countries that have nuclear weapons. So, according to nuclear deterrence theory, these countries should be the safest countries in the world, right? 
They should be the ones that are unlikely to be attacked or invaded. Uh, they should be able to get their own way wherever they go because they can threaten nuclear annihilation um, anytime they want to. These are the 186 countries that do not have nuclear weapons. So by the theory of deterrence, by simple mathematics, these countries should be less safe, less liable to attack, less likely to get their own way in the world than these nine countries. And I can tell you, if you don't already know, there is absolutely no statistical correlation between those two lists of countries. None. There's none. So there are lots of other reasons why nuclear deterrence doesn't add up. But that one, for me, is the clincher, because it's simply it's, it's impossible to explain why, even in Europe, countries that, didn't, that weren't part of NATO, weren't part of the nuclear umbrella, were never protected by the US, they still were not invaded by the Soviet Union at, at any time. So why do people still think that it was only nuclear weapons that protected those countries? And the same goes to today. What makes anybody think that we're safer from North Korea because we have nuclear weapons? Or what makes them think they're safer from the US because they have nuclear weapons? However, even if, even if we want to accept that there is some kind of logic to deterrence, which I personally don't think there is, the one issue that is above all else, which is, brings me to the ban treaty that we've just been um, involved in, in, in the, at the UN in New York, who, who can tell me about the non-proliferation treaty? What was the grand bargain that brought almost every country in the world together to sign the non-proliferation treaty in 1968? Anybody know? You know what the Non-Proliferation Treaty is? Okay, so in 1968, virtually every country signed this treaty, and the treaty said, we promise, we 186 countries that don't have nuclear weapons, promise never to acquire them, so long as the nine countries at that time, it was only five, promised to get rid of theirs. That was the deal, that was the bargain. And in fact, the, the five nuclear countries said, we promised to get rid of them in good faith at an early date. And in my book, I have a quote from the negotiation that was going on at the time saying, you know, absolutely crystal clear, when, when we say at an early date, we mean now, we mean right away, we mean we're serious about this and we're gonna get rid of our nuclear weapons because that is the deal that we're, that we're making with the rest of the world. And did they do that? No, they did not. And that is why today um, countries are fed up with the, the, the nine countries that still have nuclear weapons and are taking it into their own hands to try to do something about it. Not only did they not get rid of their nuclear weapons, but as you probably all know, even under President Obama, they agreed a plan for refashioning re the entire nuclear um, arsenal of the United States at a cost of over a trillion dollars over the next 30 years. Every single nuclear weapon is going to be uh, expanded and developed and redone um, at a huge expense, and the same is happening in all the other nuclear countries. As I said, they got rid of a lot of old ones and small ones from the Cold War period, but they are not in any way uh, doing anything to get rid of nuclear weapons as such. In fact, they're really going all out to, to develop and expand their, their capacity. And a trillion dollars in 30 years is equivalent to three million, more than three million dollars per hour, every hour for the next 30 years. That's how much money is being spent on nuclear weapons. It's not just on nuclear weapons, but on the re redevelopment of them. So, this is what led to the Ban Treaty. Now, um, I don't know how much you heard, it didn't get much coverage in the, in the newspapers. The only coverage I saw was because Nikki Haley, the U.S. ambassador to the U.N., gave a press conference outside the beginning of the, of the negotiations to say why they weren't going to take part. And for me, it was very exciting because it was the first time I was inside the room with all these negotiations going on, and the U.S. government was outside protesting. That was kind of fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they, but, and they, they couldn't stop it. They really wanted to stop it. But they didn't, and it's right here. This is the treaty that outlaws nuclear weapons. It's been something that the United Nations, it was the very first resolution, resolution number one of the United Nations to <laughs> take this step, and it's finally happened after 70 years. And Vicky was there as well, and, and uh, Jeff mentioned this woman, Satsuko. I don't know, if she, was she, has she been in Northampton? No. No. Well, she is one of several 
the Hibakusha, you know, survivors of the, of the uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs, they've been campaigning their entire life for this moment. And they were in the room when it happened, they were very, very emotional and excited about it mm -hmm. because people have been working for so long on this issue and it's not, you know, the, the treaty by itself is not going to get rid of a single weapon. We know that. Um, it's, and the, the nuclear countries, the countries with nuclear weapons have not signed the treaty and they may never sign it. I mean, they've, they've issued a statement saying they're never going to sign it, but I can tell you that some of them will sooner or later. But it's a, it's a historic occasion because the countries that don't have nuclear weapons finally took the initiative and were willing to stand up to these countries and, and say, you know, enough is enough. We do not accept these as illegitimate weapons. They're weapons of mass destruction. We've got rid of biological weapons. We've got rid of chemical weapons. And we've got to get, we've got to get rid of nuclear weapons. We've got to say clearly, unequivocally, these are immoral, unacceptable, and illegal. And that's the, this was the um, Austrian government making a pledge a couple of years ago that we were going to move to this step. It took quite a few um, uh, meetings and, and you know, a lot of diplomacy to get all these countries in the room and to agree. Um, but the, the, this ban treaty now prohibits, once, it, it only prohibits for the countries that sign it, but have we got any lawyers in the room, Because um, uh, what I've been told is that under, under international law, which is, excuse me, <clears throat> which is still something that's evolving and developing, once, once a treaty comes into effect and a, and a majority of countries sign it, it becomes, you know, eventually it becomes part of customary international law and is accepted as, as law even if other countries don't sign it. So for instance, there are a lot of treaties that the U.S. has never signed, as you probably know, like the rights of the child is the only country in the entire world which has not signed that treaty, but they still are under enormous pressure to abide by a lot of the the statutes in it. Same with the Landmines Treaty. The US and a number of other countries have not signed the Landmines Treaty in 1997, but since 1997 they haven't used landmines because the pressure is too great. World public opinion, the influence of other countries, the fact that they could end up in, in the, you know, in world courts or other, other cases, you know, they, they have these effects. And one of the things about the Ban Treaty, which um, for me, makes it all worthwhile is that we know the U.S. government does not like this treaty, so it's got to be doing something good. Uh, this is a this is a paper that was released, uh, which was written by the U.S. government to all the NATO countries, and basically said in it, if you sign this treaty, it's going to have a direct impact on the U.S. ability to meet its extended deterrent commitments. You know, to have weapons in South Korea and Japan and all across Europe and so on. It's going to make it impossible for us to undertake nuclear planning and training. It's going to make it impossible for ships to conduct port calls. And most importantly, it's going to make the concept of nuclear burden sharing untenable. Yeah. Now, in plain English, what they're saying is, if all these countries sign this treaty, even if we don't sign it, this, this, is, this is creating a climate where nuclear weapons are not acceptable. They're not acceptable to the general public, they're not acceptable to the, to the governments, and it's going to start impinging and affecting even the US, even long before they sign it. And uh, we know from the, the, the dark reality of these things, you know, it's all about money and corporations and business that, that fuels this nuclear industry. And the countries that are likely to sign this treaty are also countries that may be involved in producing spare parts or may be involved in financing like Switzerland, you know, banks and so on. And if those countries are signing the treaty and saying they're not going to have anything to do with uh, financing, transport, or anything to do with nuclear weapons, that is going to have an effect and that's what we're counting on. And this is my favorite um, uh, scientific uh, data. It's called a weaselometer. So what, what the, um, the countries that do not have nuclear weapons but are still not supporting this treaty are, are called by some the weasel states. And so down on this side you see um, that uh, the kiloblahs, you know, countries that talk a lot about how great they are but won't sign anything. 
And then down here you've got the milli squirms of you know, how far they will go to try to avoid signing up to the ban treaty. And you've got countries, so over here, you know, Switzerland, Switzerland and Sweden are totally on board with the, with the, with the ban treaty and they are, they are playing a major part in it. The Netherlands and Japan are both under so much pressure from their own people and their own parliaments that they had to be there. They had to be there even though Japan went there and then withdrew and the Netherlands went there and then voted against the treaty. They're under, they're, they're, that's going to be the worst thing the Dutch government has ever done, I can tell you. They're, when they went home, they're going to be under such a barrage of public opinion and protesting and they've got elections coming up and the, as in Germany, um, Germany, Canada, Belgium, Australia, these are countries that are going to sign this treaty sooner or later because the public opinion is not going to um, accept anything less than that. And a lot of these other countries are too afraid to, to stand up to the US government. But things are moving and um, uh, we've got here in the Netherlands. One of the funniest things that happened in the United Nations last year when they were going, they were voting whether to have these negotiations. And the vote, and three NATO countries voted, yeah, sure, we should have these negotiations. And then they were obviously told by the US, what are you doing? You can't vote for that. So they said, oh, we voted by mistake. So can we please change our vote? Um, but, you know, a lot of these other countries are, are moving. And, and as I said, public opinion uh, is, is moving very, very strongly in favor of this. Uh, we did an opinion poll in the UK and 75% of British adults thought the UK government should be taking part in these negotiations and voting for a ban. In Germany, it's 93%. That's a pretty large percentage. So that's why you know, we had a German parliamentarian there who said, you know, I guarantee you Germany will sign this treaty. Sooner or later, they will sign it. And they will remove the last few nuclear weapons they have on their soil, which are US um, um, you know, F-35 missiles, whatever. So, um, how are we doing? We're, we're about to wrap up. This is, I hope this is the uplifting part, because it's, it's, it is very exciting. This was the moment that uh, the countries voted. Um, 122 in favor and one against, which was the Netherlands, and one abstention, which was Singapore, for some reason. I don't know why. I guess US ships you know, go through Singapore, so they're a bit worried. But it doesn't matter now, because the, the treaty has already been uh, agreed by 122 to 1, which means that it's open for signing on September 20th. All the heads of state are going to be at the United Nations, presidents, prime ministers, and so on, and there will be a signing ceremony. And I wouldn't be surprised if at least 122 sign on that occasion. But even if they don't, there will be an ongoing opportunity. They can sign, they've got to ratify. It comes into force after, um, I think, 50 countries sign it. And we will have a boundary. And as I said, it's not going to get rid of all the weapons, but it is in a very, very important and crucial step towards that. And we've been waiting a very long time for that. And this is the president of the negotiations, um, and a woman called Elaine White from Costa Rica, who um, was very, very skillful in, in pulling this whole thing off and getting everybody to agree to this treaty. You can see she, this is just a moment after the, after the after the numbers came in on the, on the big board saying that it was 122 to one. You can see she's a little bit reserved, she's very excited, but she's trying to follow the protocol in the UN, which is that you're not supposed to smile, you're not supposed to clap, you're not supposed to laugh or hug or you know, stand up or cheer, but people could not withhold themselves. And so um, we've got more and more people breaking out and starting to clap and the standing ovation, and hugging and kissing. And there she is. <laughs> so, and then we just arranged for some fireworks to just, oh, just uh, I mean, it was, it was July 7th, so we, we pre prepared uh, in case that they agreed the, the treaty. We, we already had our banner ready for, for this photo. <laughs> and um, I've always wanted to fill in this poster, which we've had around for several years, when all these other weapons have been banned. And you can see nuclear weapons banned down here, 2017. Yeah. And one of the, so 
so we're just about finished, but one of the questions I was asked this morning was, well, how realistic is it that we can actually get rid of these weapons? You know, they've been around all this time, huge vested interest. Has anybody seen this statue? It's outside the UN building in New York. I, I saw it and I thought, oh, that looks like, like a nuclear missile then. It's like St. George and the Dragon, the, like the nuclear dragon. And I actually put a picture up saying this was, you know, St. George and the nuclear dragon. And then I looked it up. And this statue is actually made out of uh, missiles, nuclear missiles from the Soviet Union and the United States that were dismantled during the Cold War as a result of one of the treaties. So this is proof, living proof, that this is possible. It's been done. We know how to get rid of the weapons. We know how to monitor and inspect and evaluate and make sure people don't cheat. All that's been worked out. All we have to do is get these countries to actually agree to it. And with the pressure that we're putting on them, and the pressure that you're going to put on them now, I'm confident that we will actually make some, make some progress, finally. So, the first thing you can do is familiarize yourselves with the issues and the arguments and the reasons why we've got to take this step. And if you have any doubts, there's a great book just there you can have a look at. A $15 special offer. Uh, this, if you don't want to spend that much money, there's also the postcard version and the, uh, the four-page version and the 12-page version. Those are all free. Um, write, call, visit, talk to your Congress people. There wasn't a single member of the US Congress supporting this treaty. And here in Massachusetts, uh, you've got some really strong, powerful people who could be speaking out about this, and they've got to do it. We've got to get them on board. So please go and talk to Elizabeth Warren or whoever and tell them about this treaty and about how important it is and try to get them on board because we need to start this going. And there's no reason we can't start in Northampton and move on from there. Northampton and then the world. Um, you know, get, get the message out. Talk to people on social media, on Facebook. Go on the local radio. They're, they're very keen to have people on the radio, apparently, because they took me. And, and they have, they, you know, they, they, same with the Daily Hampshire Gazette. It's obviously very short of news. So get, you know, write letters to the answer. And most importantly, talk to people that you know about this issue, because the people that you have the most influence on are the people that care about you. And uh, I've been running workshops in the UK for the last couple of years to try to help people to have conversations and get, get this word out to people because the, the arguments just do not stand up. But people don't base their arguments on, on logic. You know, it's, it's about emotion, it's about how you hear, you know, who, who you care about, what do they think and what do other people think. We've got, to, we've got to use all the tools available to us to talk to people and convince them that we've got to do, we've got to take this step and we've got to get rid of these weapons while we still have the chance to do so. Yeah. It's also about all the money from the air bases. Sure. I lived in Great Falls, Montana. Mm -hmm. And back in uh, the early 19, uh, mid 1990s, there was a time when they were going to close one of the three Minutemen bases. There, there's one in Wyoming, mm -hmm. one in North Dakota, one in, 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 in Montana. And they prayed this, this base closing commission through. And of course, they turned all the school kids out of the schools to line the route that these people were taking. And you know, with, without that base there, the, the, the town's uh, funds would, would really dry up. Well, that's, 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 that's one of the arguments that's in the book that's, that's talked about because you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a common thing. You know, we need the jobs, we need the money. But if you think about, just for a moment, you know, at the end of the Second World War, how many people came home from the war, came home from the munitions factories, and had to find other work? You know, the country has to adjust and adapt to new situations, and it happens all the time, whether you're talking about any kind of industry. You know, things change over, over, over time, and people have to adjust, and it's a matter of national priorities, it's a matter of how, how strongly this, how important this is. And obviously, if, you know, if it's your job, and you know, until you can see your way beyond that, you know, it's 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 up to the rest of us to say we've got to change our priorities. We've got to do something about this incredibly dangerous situation that we're facing. Well, some of us spoke, and we were just shouting down. Yeah. Well, come to my workshop, and we'll talk about it. We, we're working on we're working on the exact same thing in in England with the Barrow Shipyards, which is where they build the nuclear submarines, and they're desperate for those jobs. They're desperate for the income. The, the community is, is totally 
centered around this, this one industry. And, um, but there are people working there and working on this issue and talking, talking about it. You know, they may be the last people to be convinced, but that's, you know, we've, we've got to work wherever we can. So, on, so the, that that note, on that note, yeah. let's move into questions and answers. And right. um, because we want to limit this to maybe 15, maybe 20 minutes, um, I just like to ask folks to try to keep your questions as short as possible. Um, so please just raise your hand and I will run over to wherever you are. I was 26 years old when we dropped the bomb. And uh, I was a bride living in New Orleans and my husband was planning to go into radiology. He had heard scuttlebutts as he was in the army uh, overseas for three and a half years that we had split the atom and were working on a bomb. So that when we heard that they had dropped the bomb, it was devastating. And, uh, you know, it seems to be that our country is in deep denial about what happened. And uh, there was very little information at the time the bomb was dropped or shortly thereafter about the damage it had caused. And, you know, it was Wolford Burchett, I think, who Amy Goodman talks about every year who was a British a correspondent who found his way to Hiroshima and Nagasaki and saw what happened and tried to get the information out. And our country would not permit that information to be shared. And it wasn't until, I think, two years later that uh, there was a, a, a New Yorker, uh, article that took up the whole magazine that told in some detail about what had happened. And I think the same thing is alive and well in this country. As you say, you know, the arms industry is the industry of our culture. And uh, so I have put uh, a request in from the Northampton City Council that we put a war article on the council for the second uh, Thursday in September. And this would be the Nuclear Weapons Free Future Group along with AFSC and other groups here will be working on it. And uh, so that we um, build um, the head of the council, Bill, Bill, Dwight. Dwight. Bill Dwight, is very much in support of the, this resolution uh, that would you know, back up what you're talking about, that we would no longer fund uh, increased funding for the War Department. War Department, I refuse to call it defense. It doesn't defend. <laughs> has nothing to defend except for, and so, uh, and that we will not pay for any more new, new, no, new nuclear weapons. So uh, my city councilman supports it, as does uh, several others. So that I think that's one thing we can all do is begin to talk to our council people to get them to approve of this resolution. Thank you, Tim and Francis. Um, many of us in this room are part of um, a lot of work against nuclear weapons for many, many years. And I just would love to hear you say something about protests in this country. You know, when hearing about other countries right now, um, could you just speak to um, this denial, this ignorance, but could you say something about kernels of protest? And clearly you're very much involved in the story. Well, I think, I think Francis could tell you a lot more than me or, or Jeff. Because <laughs> uh, I haven't, I've just come back to this country, um, so I'm still, I'm still catching up. I know there is lots of protests going on, and, um, you know, there's, there's um, people, you know, living at the, the um, 
bases where you know it, the, the nuclear submarine bases in Washington State, for instance, and at the Ground Zero in Nevada or wherever that is, and Los Alamos, uh, you know, these places where they where they're doing the nuclear work and, and maintain the missiles. But we, we met uh, in New York two nuns who are very involved in um, I think it is Montana or where where the where the ICBM you know uh, missile silos are, you know. So there's lots going on, but we don't hear much about it. And, um, and I think, um, hopefully, we can, we can spread that around. I, ha I have got a website for the book, and I'm going to try to put as much information as I can, links. There's, there's lots of information, but, you know, people don't find know where it is. So I'm going to try to help people to find that. But I can't tell you more about what's happening in this country. Did anybody else maybe answer her? <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, so there's about uh, 70 countries that, that did not participate in the conference? No, about 30. 30. About 30, okay. I, I thought there were about 190 yeah, countries. Yeah, so it gets, it's complicated because yeah. there, were, there were about 140 countries taking part at one point or another, but about 20 of them didn't, didn't vote for one reason or another, mainly because they didn't, they didn't get their act together to get the accreditation to be able to vote. Because a lot of these countries, and I, you know, I'm learning about the UN, but a lot of these smaller islands and so on, you know, they've only got one person, they got to be at several different meetings, and they, they don't prioritize this, or they don't get their act together in time, then they can't, they can't actually vote. Mm -hmm. So there's more than the 120. I gather from your weaseliness diagram that yeah. most of those countries were um, intimidated by the United States in some way. Were, were others intimidated by, say, Russia or other players? Uh, well, um, I mean, Belarus, I think Ukraine was there, but not Belarus. No, Ukraine was not there either. So there were some Eastern European countries that may have been pressured by, the, by Russia, but it was mostly the NATO countries and you know, South Korea, Japan, Australia, but you know, not New Zealand, which is very independent minded, and, um, and not some of the countries in Europe like, like the Netherlands and Sweden and so on. But yeah, there's, there's, um, what I think, I, I think I said, you know, one, one of the significant things about this process is not just to do with nuclear weapons, but a lot of people who've been involved in the UN, uh, you know, over many years, were saying that the, this treaty, because the US and these other big countries weren't there, this opened the door to all these smaller countries who have not really had a voice in the UN. You know, they're always squashed by the bigger powers, and they suddenly had a voice. They were feeling really empowered to, you know, and it's, it's a shift of power politics in the, in the international system for these countries to stand up against the U.S. and to start, you know, saying, well, we don't, we don't accept this anymore. So that was quite exciting in itself. Um, when, when you made that comment earlier about under 30 versus over 30, I couldn't help but wonder who you were talking about. <laughs> um, and so my question relates to that, you can see what I can see. In 10 years, I'll be more or less alone in this room. So my question is two parts. One, when did peace go out of fashion? And two, how do you get people Jeff's age and younger to be interested in it? <laughs> well, one of the exciting things, another exciting thing about the, um, the Ban Treaty, which I didn't, I didn't have any pictures of, but the people involved in this treaty, uh, from the from the non-government side, so I mean, I was there representing Quakers, and there were people there from the Red Cross, from all kinds of organizations across. There were 400 organizations from 100 countries involved in supporting this process, and they were predominantly young people. Uh, and that you know, from Africa, from Nigeria, and Zimbabwe, and South Africa, and Brazil. I understand and what I'm talking about in this country. So I mean, I'm just saying that there is this this uh, swell of new, new people that have come in that are younger, and I think they have got, they have got to reach out to people in this country. I mean, there were, there were quite a few young people there as well from the US, from you know, colleges and so on. Um, but I think, I think the word has to get out. It's up to you. The word has to get out to your, your peers. You know, this is an important issue. I have just, uh, Pat's yeah. next in the queue, but I just wanted to respond just to the yeah. issue of younger people, and, and yeah. for me, um, one of the things that our office does is work on nuclear issues, and for most 
Um, we have enough, about a dozen interns who work in our office over the course of the year, um, and for many of them, it's the first time they realize that nuclear weapons is, uh, are still an actual serious threat in the world. Um, and so it's, it's sort of like going through you know, incredul incredulity you know, to like, come on, this is really a thing, to, to sort of the re realization that not only is this an issue, but there really isn't that much organizing to, uh, you know, to the extent that climate change or Black Lives Matter issues or whatever the, the much more popular movements are today. And I think that's what our task is, and, and that's what we try to do, is just to sort of wake people up to, to this issue being something. Um, I am not quite perhaps as, as young. I, I actually was a child in the 80s, and so I do have this vague recollection of living under the threat of you know, mutually assured destruction. Um, folks, uh, young people today that I deal with, no such thing. And so I think that's part of the struggle, is to just get that onto their radar. Yeah, I'll, I'll just follow up from there. I did a very casual look at the no comparison with media, at the mention or news of or opinion pieces of nuclear weapons versus climate change. And climate change by far, you know, factor two, three, four, was much more covered by media. So I think part of the ignorance and then lack of passion or passivity in this country is also very much shaped by what's in the news. I barely saw anything in the news, major news, more than once, if once, on the new treaty, UN treaty, that yeah. under 22 countries signed. Yeah. And think of the Paris Climate uh, Accord. It was covered before, during, and after for so long, which it should have been, but also so should this have been. And so it's a form of educating the public who never hears about it in school. Did you have classes in school in nuclear weapons or lectures in school when you were in college? Or when when was you were that? Mm -hmm. Oh, you weren't? <laughs> no, <I'm sorry>. no. <laughs> I mean, do you What's your question? Let's get it over with. The question, <laughs> yeah, no, the question so is, nice. did you learn in university and high school about nuclear weapons? I mean, my, my concern is that students in science classes aren't learning about it. The major media and, and progressive media even doesn't cover it. And so we have an ignorant public. Well, we can do something about that. Everybody in this room can just get out there and tell people. Yeah. Let's just do uh, two more questions. Is it known if the nuclear weapons that are lost or Let's say if not in storage, can those be detonated? Um, yeah, I don't. I don't know enough about the technicalities. You know, and I steered clear of that because I didn't want to get, you know, thrown in jail for my book. But um, you know, I think there are certainly when when the Soviet Union collapsed, a lot of nuclear material went missing, and there are still worries about that. You know, where where is it? In whose hands is it? What could be done with it? Um, the, I mean, the good news is that nuclear weapons, you know, the, 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 the technology for nuclear weapons are, is incredibly expensive and complicated. And so it is only a few countries that have managed to, you know, build them. And so that's the good news. You know, it's not just something you can, in theory, you know, you can go out and dig up your own uranium and make your own bomb, you know, but it's not very, it's not practical. So I think... Um, there's reason to be worried. That the whole, there's lots of reasons to be worried, and that's why we've got to do something about it. But in the, you know, the immediate answer to your question is probably not. How many more questions? <laughs> um, if you're looking for a group working on um, nuclear disarmament that's um, that's mostly younger folks, um, take a look at uh, Global Zero. Global Zero stands for In the Globe Zero. <laughs> nuclear weapons that's um, mostly people in their 20s, maybe 30s. One last yeah, question. I, don't, uh, I have a suggestion for people here in this room, which is of course buy the book, but also ask your local public library to buy the book. It's something you can do, it's very simple, you could even do it online. Just put in a purchase request. Thanks. Good idea. And on that note, uh, I want to thank Tim uh, and Vicki for bringing Tim and for both of you being at the UN, not just here, but also being at the UN in 
being such a critical part of history. And so, thank you. So, uh, folks, thank you for coming, and please, if you want a copy, um, the, the authors will